Welcome to another transition talk. I am Miriam Glez, the founder of Athlete Soul, and I'm here today with Kristen. She will introduce herself in a minute. We are here to talk about um, athletic retirement and the challenges that come with it. And I'm passing it on straight away to Kristen to tell us about her story. She was a basketball player and also her retirement. But Kristen, can you start with a short overview of your professional basketball career? Yeah, great. Thank you. So as you said, I'm Kristen Rasmussen and I grew up in East Lansing, Michigan. And I am the youngest of five. And so all my brother and sisters were athletes and we played all the time. And I remember going to their games and my parents would say oh, things like, hey, if you jump for the rebound, you're more likely to get it. Uh, and giving me little pointers along the way as I watched them through their, their uh, athletic careers and also musical careers. Uh, I started playing basketball super young, but one of the things my parents did is introduce a bunch of sports so that I wasn't focused on it. So playing softball and soccer and volleyball, uh, tennis, you name it, we were, we were involved. And then in high school, I played uh, on the varsity team for four years. I also ran track and it's, I started doing, you know, like the 400 and the mile relay. And then by the time I was done, I was doing shot put and discus and high jump. Uh, so I thoroughly enjoyed that side of my high school career. From high school was uh, recruited and went to Michigan State. So Michigan State University is in the backyard of where I grew up. And I stayed there because I am close to my family and I wanted them to be able to come to the majority of the games. Uh, so after Michigan State University, I was drafted into the WNBA and myself and one of my teammates were the first ever Michigan State Spartans to be drafted into the league. And from there, I played 10 seasons in the league. I also spent 13 seasons overseas and playing in different countries, uh, Australia, played in Spain, played in Switzerland, played in France. Um, there's quite a few that I played for, <laughs> uh, but upon retiring, I was trying to decide if I wanted to go back overseas and play or if I wanted to get straight into coaching. And after 13 years or seasons doing overseas, decided that I wanted to try my hand at coaching. Wow, that's a pretty long and diversified career. That's quite amazing. Um, and good on you for being able to play so many sports in high school and then eventually uh, choosing basketball. Yes. Did your, your, your season from the women NBA and the international season, were, were they sort of aligned? Like you did 10 years, 10 years, and then won the, won the WNBA and the, the international sport career ended as well? Uh, close, almost. Uh, during that time, it was year-round basketball. So WNBA is in the summer months in the States and then overseas is the rest of the time. So did that for a while, but at one point I decided to try coaching. And so went into coaching and then decided I'm not ready yet. And so continued playing until uh, personally for me, it was if I was not giving the sport 110%, then that was when I knew I needed to retire. So you had a little uh, question or change of heart at some point where you sort of saw the incoming tried your hand at something else, came back, you know, and then, and then had an official retirement after that. Is that what happened? Yeah, it was. And to be honest, I never pictured myself retiring. I always thought that I would have basketball in my life. Uh, and I still do to some degree, but it's not at the level that I was playing at. But it, it, it's interesting as I think back on when I retired, uh, leading up to it, it wasn't like, oh, this year is going to be my last year. It was always like, I just kept playing and kept playing and wanting to, but it was at that point when it wasn't fun to go to practice and traveling to different cities for teams. It, it wasn't fun. And I was disrespecting the sport. That's how I took it. Uh, 
And so that's when I knew I, I needed to, to hang up the playing ones professionally and, and try something else. So with your lack of, of motivation and enjoyment for the sport, led you to make that decision yourself of like stepping away from it and doing something else? Is this what happened? Correct. Correct. And I, I am grateful for that, that it wasn't uh, an injury that was career ending. It was on my own accord of play until I absolutely knew that I couldn't any longer. And, you know, people on the team would call me the mother of the team <laughs> because I was older and I, I loved it. I, I love playing. I still enjoy playing, but I knew at that time it was I had other things that I needed to do in my life as well. And you seem to have had a pretty clear plan, or uh, at least at the time of what you wanted to do upon retirement. You, you know, you had your heart set on going into coaching. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I don't know if I would say my heart was set on coaching, but I wanted to stay in the game. And that was the only avenue I knew and my resume provided that coaching would be the next step. There wasn't a whole lot of uh, what would I do when I retired? It was, oh, well, the next step is obviously coaching because that's what my background is. Uh, and so I did, I did have an opportunity to go and play back over in Spain, or I had an opportunity to go and coach at a division three level. And I decided I'm gonna try coaching and see how that is. And that's how that, that career path started. Wow. So you jumped right in. You went from playing to coaching and collegiate season. So how was that, that first year of transition for you? Eye-opening. <laughs> it was wow. Because as an athlete and a very competitive one at that, I was bringing that straight into a, a team that I would say academics was just as important as their athletic careers. So do you feel that there was a misalignment perhaps between how you were approaching your coaching and the game to what the athletes you know, were here for? Absolutely. And I think the understanding of what coaches have to do and all the behind the scenes that as athletes, we don't necessarily see, or maybe we take for granted. Mm -hmm. uh, that was, that was a very big shock for me that it, I wasn't just the coach, but I was also, you know, the bus driver. I was the, the laundry service. I was the recruiter. I was the scheduling coordinator. I was a psychologist at times. I was there for them if their moms or their parents or grandparents weren't there I was it so it was very eye-opening because going from playing on the court to showing up to having a scouting report of what you're doing to now leading and guiding uh, in a different aspect of not being on the court that was that was very challenging but uh, exciting at the same time because I enjoy challenges and I enjoy putting myself in a, in a situation that I have to figure out how to be successful. Did you have a lot of time during that period? Obviously you were really busy being in a school that didn't necessarily have the same resources that you were able to enjoy as a player. Mm -hmm. Did you have any time to think about what was going on for you in terms of, okay, I've you know left an amazing career as a player. I am now starting you know, from the bottom as a coach, you know, how am I doing? Did you have any time to, for any of that? Or it was like rush, rush, rush? That is a great question because no, I didn't. I just jumped right in and tried to naturally pick up how I was going to be the best coach I could. And uh, looking back at it now, I didn't, I didn't have resources. I didn't I uh, really know what I was doing. I was just put into this position knowing what my past was and relying on my past experiences of how to make myself the best coach that I could be. Wow. So a lot of pressure for a, uh, a first job out of your, you know, your professional career. Um, how long did it last and, and what did you do afterwards? So I stayed there for five years. And then after that, decided that needed to, I needed to move back to 
where my family was in Michigan. So that was on the East Coast uh, that I was coaching. Uh, and so my family and I moved back to Michigan and I took a position as my old high school coach for the girls basketball team. Wow. That's a, a back to the roots, back <laughs> to where you were coming from. Um, and you know, how, how did that go? How different was it from the collegiate coaching position? Yeah, it was not as much, I would say, but the one thing that I had a lot of was the parents. And the parents are pretty tight to their high school kids. <laughs> and so dealing with that aspect of it uh, was, again, eye-opening and, and frustrating at the same time. I think with coaching, I wasn't expecting all of the extras because as a player, I was somebody that just came in and did it and did my job. And if I wasn't good, I was in the gym. Not Somebody didn't have to tell me or say, these are when the open hours are to come in. It was like, I took the initiative to do it myself. Whereas coaching kids is different. And they, some of them don't have that built in. And so you're trying to figure out how to, how to get the best out of each individual kid. And I think there's a lot of... Uh, <laughs> untouched, uh, unspoken words when it comes to coaches and how coaches do it. And I, I really hope that, you know, as I see my daughters going into coaching, or I'm sorry, into sports, I want to make sure that these coaches really understand what they're dealing with. And so that has sparked my interest in, in making sure that our coaches are qualified for both boys and girls sports. Yeah. And it seems that this experience is giving you the space to have more perspective and reflect on, on how sport is taught at every level. So not just having the understanding of the elite level and where you were at, but the ability to like relate to all the level of athletics. So why um, you're, you're not in sport, you're not in, you're not a coach anymore. I'm not. So what, what took you out of, of coaching and when, what do you do now? Sure. So uh, in November 2018, I received uh, an email from a former WNBA player that said that Nike is collaborating with the WNBA and they would like to offer 10 former WNBA athletes to come work at Nike in a program they called WIN, which is Women in Nike. So I looked at that, told my husband about it. And he was like, you have nothing to lose. The worst thing they could say is no. So apply. And again, put everything I had into it and was fortunate enough to be selected. And there are in the first cohort, there are 11 women and we are all at Nike. And so my current role at Nike is I am the global business coordinator for Purpose Product. Wow, what a change of career <laughs> and quite unexpected. Um, were you missing something as a coach or why did you take this opportunity? Was it just for the sake of the opportunity to do something different or do you feel like you were missing something from the coaching side? Uh, you know, that's a really great question. And as I, as I think about it, coaching was fulfilling to me. Coaching is not a lucrative job unless you go up into D1, maybe even into the NBA. I'm not, I can't speak on the WNBA because I haven't been in that realm as coaching, but I felt like there was something more that I could do and I wanted to impact the game. And so looking at this Nike opportunity, it was like, okay, I realize that Nike is, is Prada is, you know, shoes and clothing and bags, but there's something more that I feel I could do within Nike to make sport better for, for young players. Nice. That's a, you know, great way to impact even more people than what you could have done at a, at a youth athletic, um, you know, organization. It's quite interesting. Absolutely. Uh, talk to us a little bit about your experience of athletic retirement. So we hear a lot of athletes talk about loss of identity or loss of purpose or struggling just with the routine of the day. 
Mm -hmm. um, are these things anything that you experience? Because it's it's often difficult, you know. Even if if so, you if you go from athletes to coach, sometimes you may experience your retirement, you know, post coaching career. Mm -hmm. Did it happen like this for you? Did it happen earlier? How did it go? Yeah, it's uh, reflecting back on it. It's a very interesting process. And to be honest with you, I don't know if I still feel like I have grasped this whole retirement thing because inside I still feel like that professional athlete. I still even feel like I look like it <laughs> and that doesn't happen. But, uh, you know, as I, as I retired and went straight into coaching, it's like, I just put everything into coaching and I didn't feel like I had the time to reflect on myself as a person it wasn't until I got to this corporate world where I'm just like, wow, it's, it's, I do miss being on that team where I can rely on others to reach our goals. I find myself thinking, is this what I pictured post sports to be? And can I please desperately go back? Because I really enjoy playing basketball. I enjoy having a coach saying, this is what we need to do and trying to figure out the ins and outs. But as I know, that's not a reality where a team is not going to ask for a 42 year old former player to come back and play. I've decided to channel all of that uh, energy of wanting something more and putting it into my career now. And so taking all of the, whether it's positive or negative and funneling in that into something that I want to be. So for me, yes, I did have the loss of identity. I did have people coming up to me and being like, oh, I, I seen you on TV. Wow, that you were, oh, you were great. Here's the player card. And that is so fun. But I also want to be known as somebody that not, isn't just the basketball player. I want something else. And so that's what I'm seeking in with my role at Nike and how I can impact other people because as athletes and former athletes, we have something so special that companies want and they need. And if we could, if I could pinpoint exactly what it is, that would be great, but I can't because we're all individual and all different. But that the community of being a professional athlete is so special and I can't wait to work with other professional athletes in, in my corporate career because it just makes things so much better. I'm so glad that you're bringing this up because I was, I was going to touch on it. So can you give us, if you can, example of maybe things that are somewhat different or perhaps uncomfortable or maybe that surprised you from the from the corporate environment, maybe you didn't, you were not expecting. Yes, and I will try to keep it to a few. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, the first one was having meetings about the meetings that you have just attended. And so there's no end game or the goals are spread out. And as we all know, as athletes, we like to get those goals and then get the next one and, and keep going so that you can always better yourself. Uh, so that was one of the first things where I'm in a two hour meeting and I would find myself like wandering mentally and just like, what is happening? This is not what I expected. Uh, so again, having to learn how to uh, be in those situations or in the environment and make the best for myself and, and those around me so that we can actually obtain the goal and move forward. I would say yeah. another thing is the teamwork aspect. Whereas on my basketball team, we all worked 110% of the time and I knew who I could rely on, which was the majority of them or all of them, because we're all showing up to practice. We're all doing uh, the work to better ourselves. I would say in corporate, it is you're on a team, but not everybody's going to hold their weight and not everybody accepts their roles. Uh, I know that happens on the, on the playing side as well. But I find it very difficult, for example, if I need something, I'm going to reach out to a couple of people. And if somebody were to reach out to me, chances are I'm going to get back to them pretty quick. 
doesn't really happen there. So you have to like navigate different ways that people like to communicate. And maybe they're not an email person. Maybe they're a text person. Maybe they're an instant messenger. Or maybe they want to get on Zoom. So I find that very difficult because I enjoy working on a team where everybody is like, let's do this. Let's get after it. Boom, boom, boom. Here we go. And I think, you know, you're really hitting it on the nail. There's a lot of there's a different pace when it comes to the corporate environment, if you compare it to sport. And there's also not necessarily a direct impact of action, you know, reaction or action achieving the goal. Often, you know, you'll go down a route and it's not gonna work or there's an action, but nothing happens. Uh, and so things are just much slower, where I think as an athlete, you are really used to you know, putting in the work and seeing the progress or, you know, working as a team and it gets into the basket where this is not as obvious, not as direct. Um, and that can be quite frustrating at times, I think, for a lot of athletes, um, the change of pace, mm -hmm. yeah, the not direct, and also limited feedback, perhaps, compared to what you, you had um, with your coach. Absolutely. What about the other side of it? So there's things that are surprising. We just talked about it. Um, maybe not necessarily from a positive perspective, but what about um, the traits or the skills that you've transferred from your team sport and from your work to the corporate space? Sure. One of the things that I really enjoy is communication and how teams communicate. So I've been able to talk uh, and, and provide information and ways to communicate with teams so that your team is actually moving forward instead of being in this rut of, we have no idea what other people are thinking on the team and how do we, how do we navigate this? Um, so I, I really enjoy having that, the knowledge and everything that I've gained from playing basketball, I'm using it in the corporate world. Not necessarily, I'm not, dribbling or passing or rebounding but the other details that that happen within within teams that as professional athletes we have and others don't and so sharing that with them and I'm, I'm a big person in leading by example uh, and how I show up and whether it's a zoom call or I'm at the office I'm not gonna look a hot mess when I'm on Zoom because I just woke up taking care of myself, making sure that I pre I'm presented in a way that I wanna be seen by everyone. I think when we get into to practices or you rock up at the gym, it's just like, okay, here we go. We're, we're ready to work out, we're ready to do. And I take that to the corporate that it's like, all right, I'm ready to go, I'm ready to do my things, but I also have to look the part. And so for me, that's, that's how I approach where I'm at right now and and how I will move forward with my corporate career. Cool. And, and you had, you know, it kind of is your third career. You it were is. a professional athlete for quite a long time and then you were a coach and now you're working in corporate. Mm -hmm. Comparing, compared to other perhaps of your colleagues, you're sort of like starting from zero, but you're already well advanced uh, from a life perspective and had many other experiences before. Is this something that bothered you or, or perhaps still bother you? Like, do you feel, because a lot of athletes sometimes, you know, a lot of athletes feel they are behind, they're late in the corporate game. Is it something that even crossed your mind? Um, I think it does now that I'm, I've, so I've graduated the program that was a two year program. Uh, and now I'm in, another role than when I started. And now as I look to the next role that I would like to do, the frustrating part is that these roles that I aspire to, I've nailed it on the, the teamwork, the leadership, that side of what you had just spoken about, totally have that down pat. Where I don't, and I wouldn't say I don't have all of it, but a little bit of it is the business side mm -hmm. of the X's and O's of that, if you will. And so that holds me back. And does that frustrate me? It does because I can see where people who are my age or roughly my age, where they are in the company. And I'm thinking, man, if I had just gone straight out of college into this company, where would I be now? 
And so that plays tricks on my mind because I want to be as successful as my goals and dreams and hopes are, but I'm limited because I don't have that experience or the business side that some of my colleagues do that have gone straight from, from college into it. Well, that, that gets to be proven that you cannot do it faster than other people. I think, you know, I always hope for athletes that because you have so much um, resiliency and, and hard work and drive that you can learn those faster than some others have before. You're absolutely right. And it is, as I see it, it does not hold me back and it won't. And that's that fighter instinct that we have as athletes that we want to improve and we want to get better. So whilst I have that battle in my head, like, oh man, if I would have started this at this time, it's kind of like, I wouldn't trade anything for what I've had in my, my past career. And I'm bringing all of it to this. And really my, my dreams can be achieved. I just know I have to work a little bit harder and it's not on a court, it's in corporate. <laughs> Yeah, and remembering that your colleagues who are in those positions are probably, you know, looking at you thinking, man, I did not have the professional <laughs> athletic career that she had, right? Absolutely. Uh, I want to I shift a tiny bit and talk a little bit about uh, your family and um, health and wellness outside of your sport. Uh, obviously, as a, as a female athlete, your situation is different, perhaps, than your male counterpart. Um, tell us a little bit, you have kids, how did you manage that, uh, during your athletic career or your transition? How did it play out? Yeah, sure. I'd love to talk about my family. So during my playing career, I did not have children. Uh, I, my partner and I decided that we would wait until I was finished playing, uh, only because I had, uh, a lot of teammates that did have children and just seeing how it was for them. It just, that was my personal, personal preference. So waited until I retired. And then I, I was coaching at the time when I had my first and it was, I think it was a little bit easier than what I had imagined because I had such a great uh, support system. And, you know, as I think about it, as we were just talking about corporate and now talking about family, you have to have a support system. And if you don't have a support system, that's something that you can take upon yourself to reach out to people. And sometimes that's uncomfortable, especially as athletes, because we're just like, go get it. And I can do this myself and I've got this. But those support people around you are going to propel you forward, especially when you're on your uh, a dark day, if so. But so I started when in my coaching career, my second year, I had my daughter and I, uh, it, it was great. She would come to practices. She'd be in her little bouncer. The players loved her. Uh, I, it really was a great experience. Uh, with my second daughter, there was some health complications. And so that is when I went from college back to high school to be closer to my family. Um, and so with that, when she was born, luckily it was, uh, they had found something in utero that actually didn't come to fruition. So that was that was very, uh, I was very grateful for that. So we moved back actually to Michigan to be around my support system even more. And uh, then I had my third while, uh, while in Michigan. And I couldn't have done it without people around me to support me and help me. Cause I had, again, no idea what I'm doing. I don't know if anybody knows what they're doing when they're uh, a parent, but had people around me, siblings, friends, parents that, that helped out. And so I can't even say that being a mother is comparable to anything, because especially when they are young and they don't sleep very well. Uh, that was really hard because as an athlete, I <laughs> thoroughly enjoy sleeping and taking naps and that's kind of out the window. But as I, as I move forward, it's just, I don't, it's fun. It's fun for me to have uh, this family, to have them around, to teach them and guide them. My children are eight, five, and three, and they try basketball, but I mean, I'm six, four, my 
my husband's six, six. And so our children are very tall for their age. And so I know everybody's going to ask them, Oh, do you play basketball? Um, so I'm introducing it to them, but they're also in other sports and trying other things just, just so that they don't have to follow in mom's footsteps or play rugby like dad and, you know, trying to get them to enjoy sports at this age and not to be so focused on this is what I have to do. Hearing your story, it really uh, seems that you, your coaching experience was kind of your transition slowly away from sport that gave you the time to do, to become a mom, to Mm -hmm. get back home, kind of regroup with family and have that, that space not necessarily of a slower working space because we know how intense it is to coach at high school and college, but perhaps to be not as intense from a performance perspective and, and be able to uh, to reconnect with, with your support system and your group around you, right? Yes, that, that is 100% correct. How, how did you end up, handle the, the physical part? So... You know, do you do you still do a lot of sport? Did you do a lot of sport after you stopped playing? I mean, you were you were coaching, so you're still pretty active. But did you have something in place to take care of your of your fitness, your health? Yeah, so definitely a big part of the retirement process was making sure that I was still involved, not only in the game but also in the weight room and still working on flexibility and mobility because I have seen, you know, throughout my family and friends that after playing our metabolism might still be doing the same thing, but we're not doing the exercise or any, anything to level that out. Um, So I taught for myself, I was, I was still in the weight room. I was still shooting around And do I still do it? Absolutely. It's, it's my release. It is how I decompress. It's if I get stressed or anxious, I've got a ball in my hand or I'm going to the weight room. I tried starting up my sprint workout again. One of my downfalls is if I think I'm going to do it, I'm just going to go for it. Like I did 20 years ago. (laughs) And I have to learn how to like ease my way into it because mentally I still feel like I could go out and play. But obviously my body has something else in mind, but staying active, staying uh, physically engaged in something is, is a priority. Is it always basketball? No, but it's doing something so that I can, I can uh, feel better about myself physically because that is one of the biggest struggles for me is because mentally I still see myself as a basketball player in that physical form as a basketball player. And now it isn't. And so I do struggle with that. I still struggle with it today that it's a, it's a hard part for me to, to accept, especially after having two children and wanting to go back to where I was. And will I get there? Yeah, I'm totally determined to do it, but trying to find the time and, you know, it, it happens. So that's just something on my, on my goal list of, of trying to just to make sure that I am healthy in my mind and in my body. And nobody has that picture except for myself and that goal. So that, that is something that I get to control. Yeah. And learning to be patient and kind with yourself, because that's not something we do easily as an athlete, but when you have a, a full-time career, and three kids, and you've got to manage all of this. It's you know it's hard to find time for everything, and you you've got to be a little bit more patient than you've had in the past. Yeah, you're spot on. You are really because that is the grace that you can give yourself. You have to be kind to yourself because if not, who is? It's definitely a, a lesson learned from from retirement. You know, kind of be more gentle with yourself and and more patient because. The goals are different and the timeline is much different than when you were playing. So being able to adjust to that, you know, from a personal perspective. Um, so through this transition, what, what would you say was your most difficult 
you know, your biggest struggle, basically? Well, I think just what we were talking about is, is the, the, my personal image of you're going from practicing two to three hours a week, getting in the weight room four times a week to now I'm sitting behind a desk and I'm using more of my mental muscle than I am of my physical. And, and for me, that's really hard because I, like I said, I imagine myself looking and feeling like I did when I played. And so that to me is really hard. The other thing is that I haven't talked about is the opportunity that was presented to the, to myself and the other uh, retired WNBA players. If that wasn't there, where would I be? Would I still be in the coaching realm? And this is why connecting with you and to other athletes about setting up that foundation of networking of your, your base of people. Um, that was one thing that I didn't even think about when I was playing, when I was coaching. I mean, as a, when I was playing, had a, an agent, right? And so the agent would be able to talk to all these people. I wasn't involved in any of that. I just show up and play and sometimes collect the paycheck, depending on which country I was in <laughs> and fighting for it. But if I didn't have this opportunity that Nike presented, where would I be? And so with this opportunity that has been, uh, that I worked for and was given, I want to make sure that other athletes have an understanding of what the importance is behind having a network. And your network doesn't have to be just former athletes. It is connecting with other people out there and letting them know about who you are and what you do and the qualities that you have. Because there are a lot of people that want professional athletes and that will hire them. We just got to figure out who they are and where they are. Yeah. It's really interesting to hear your perspective on this because, you know, I come from a niche sport where I imagine that any athlete who play in a professional league has access to a huge network of for other athletes or the sponsors or the media. I never thought, oh yeah, the agent has all this and I don't necessarily need to be involved. Mm -hmm. um, and so that would be like my perspective away from it coming from a, a niche sport. And, mm -hmm. and yes, I agree with you, you know, developing that network, connecting with as many people as possible, but also observing what they do what their jobs are, because it might be something that you may want to get involved in, whether it's media, agent, sponsors, pro support service, or providers or any kind of service around that the, 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 the system, that, that support system around professional athlete and the sport industry is so gigantic and there's so many work opportunities that we, not everybody has to go into coaching and there are yes, many sir. different path that can provide a, a pretty uh, successful and, and purpose, purposeful career as well. Yeah, I think you're spot on because most people, it is like you look at your resume and it's that sport. And so coaching is like the next step, but that has to change. And you're right, there are so many opportunities out there, but how do we get there? How do we navigate that space? I know after I was done playing, it was, I just had to take it upon myself to be like, I guess I'm looking for colleges to apply for, to coach, because I know I'm really good, but I don't have the background of, of coaching. So how do I, how do I navigate that space? And I think with what you're doing and having athletes rely on athletes and help us to understand how do you manage this retirement? What happens when you're done playing? And there was nothing like that when I was there. And so this is so important and so necessary and so needed because now we can rely and help each other as we navigate this space. And, you know, as athletes determine, relentless, let's get after it. And that's what we're gonna have to do once we are done playing. Until you figure out and get to that spot where you are, it's all about helping others, making sure that you can, you can do what you want to do, but it's hard to do it alone. Absolutely. So you, you sort of hinted already 
to what I was going to ask you, but I'll ask it again. Um, any advice for athletes who are preparing for their retirement and, um, you know, want to figure out what's next? So for those who are in the process of retiring right now. Mm -hmm. Connecting. I would connect with old coaches. I would connect with former teammates. I would connect with athletic directors. I would connect with club owners, uh, reaching out to them, letting them know, because these people care about you and they cared about your career. But now some of them have lost touch and they don't know where you are. So having the uh, encouragement to go and connect back with those people you never know who these people might know, or they might know of a job or somebody that's looking for somebody to, as an intern or somebody to follow them. Uh, there's so many connections that people have, but we have to put ourselves out there. And as having an agent before coming into Nike, somebody told me, you are now your own agent. And I was just like, holy cow, that's a lot. Like, wow but they were right. I am. So how am I going to position myself? How am I going to do this? And I can't do it alone. So by connecting with people, whether they're within Nike or outside Nike, letting them know about myself, and then in turn, you're finding out about them. And so then becomes this beautiful relationship of how not only you're helping yourself, but now you're helping those around you. So Bottom line, connecting, connect with people from your past 100%. Yeah. And I call this like planting seeds. You're like planting these little seeds around you mm -hmm. until you kind of see which one is going to develop into a tree where you can collect the fruits from your work. So, you know, planting, planting as many seeds as possible in every direction, you know, one of them will end up coming, you know, be, begin, becoming bigger and, yes. you know, yeah, I love that analogy. Yeah. Perfect. It's great. Anything you would have done differently? Oh man, I think there's probably a lot of things I would have, <laughs> I would have done differently. Uh, but I think once I, upon knowing that I was going to retire, I would have liked to know what else is out there besides coaching. So again, kind of redundant, but reaching out to different people and saying, what is there? What, what are you doing? What does, it, what does it take to do X, Y, and Z? Um, and really understand what is out there because as you talked about earlier, there are so many jobs out there, but how do we do it? How do we get there? How do you know about it? And you're only gonna know about it if you put yourself out there and again, become your own agent and really market yourself. And that's hard. That was hard for me coming out of college, not knowing what to do next and being uh, drafted was absolutely what I wanted. Uh, there was a hiccup at that point where I went to a team and I was cut and I had no idea what I was going to do. Uh, luckily, at one of these combines that I went to, I happened to get, I was sitting on a chair and a gentleman walked by that was older than I was. And I just gave him my chair, sat on the ground and stretched, whatever. Didn't think anything of it. After I was cut three days later, this gentleman that I gave the chair to happened to be the head coach for the Miami soul. And he was like, I want you to come to Miami. And I was like, Holy cow, Miami, this is going to be great. He was like, I love your basketball, but what I really love is the person you are. And I didn't think anything of it, but as retiring from it, we've got to take those things that we did and move forward and promote ourselves and do the things that we have control of because we really are in control of our destiny. Don't let anybody else do it because nobody did it when we were playing. We were in control of what we wanted. That's perfect. And I think we're going to end on that because it's so true. You know, you're the one who drives the bus here. So Continue to drive the bus, whether it's in your sport or after. Mm -hmm. Con continue to be leading the way. Yep, and so invite anybody you want on that bus of yours. Because it's exactly. it, will make, it will make the ride so much more enjoyable. Perfect. Well, Kristen, thank you so much for sharing about your journey. 
your story, what you're doing with Nike, what you've learned from your sport and your, you know, bringing along with you in this next uh, career of yours. And uh, thanks for your time as well. Thank you so much for having me. And I look forward to many more conversations with you.